Okay, hello everyone. Um, it is one o'clock, so I think that we will get started. So welcome everyone to our fourth webinar from the Supportive Services team at St. Joseph's Hospice. Uh, my name is Kayla Sleggers and I'm the Supportive Services Coordinator. And my colleague uh, here is Lisa Adams, who will be presenting most of today's webinar um, on caregiving and COVID-19. So just a reminder that you are all muted and you have no camera um, access. And so not, not to worry if you're you know, eating your lunch or your pets at home, whatever it may be, we can't see you or hear you. Um, so you can use the chat box though at any time. Feel free to type in your questions um, or if you have any concerns and I'll be monitoring the chat box and we will address uh, your questions at the end of the webinar today. Uh, we will also record, be recording the webinar, so you may share it or watch it again at a later time. Um, and we will be posting our recording of the webinar on our hospice YouTube channel. And so we will share that with you all uh, next week, along with the handouts from today's presentation. Uh, so we are also happy to share any other caregiver resources that we uh, will be talking about at the end of today's presentation with you by email. So just a reminder as well, today's webinar um, is intended for uh, informal caregivers, meaning that family members or, uh, or for relatives um, instead of professionals. So although if we do have some professionals listening today, uh, we do hope that um, kind of regardless of what your, your caregiving role is, that you will learn something today um, and be able to kind of practice that in either your personal um, and or professional lives. So of course, today we will be talking about caring for a loved one with a life limiting illness. And so some of our content uh, may be triggering for you. So just please know that we uh, will be available uh, for you to contact or be connect with us after today's uh, webinar if needed. So I am now gonna hand things over to my colleague, Lisa Adams to get started. Thank you, Kayla. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Adams, and I am the Living Life Well Program Coordinator at St. Joseph's Hospice. Um, essentially, my role is to oversee the caregiver and the illness support programs. Before we get started, I just wanted to kind of point out this picture that we see on our screen of a family who are connecting with each other um, virtually as opposed to in person. And I'm sure that many of us at this time are familiar with this scene, um, but in particular today, we will be discussing how the current pandemic is affecting the palliative, their caregivers and their families and providing some guidance on, or, and tools on how to assist um, in these situations. So as you can see, there's a lot of items that we will be covering today in our hour together. Um, but before we get started with that, I wanted to talk a little bit about caregiving in general. Um, caregiving can sometimes be described as being thrown into the deep end of the pool and not knowing how to swim and you don't have a life jacket. You're basically trying to swim without any formal lessons. Caregivers really have a difficult job to do, and we can't pretend that uh, they won't feel frustrated and isolated at times. What you need to know is that caregiving is a journey with some smooth sailing and also some really stormy weather. And people have told me that it often feels like they're on a roller coaster. There's lots of ups and downs, and they really try to appreciate the good times when they come. As circumstances change, um, the level of your care as a caregiver will change as well. And sometimes there will be doubt, and sometimes you may even wonder um, if you're doing enough, if you're doing it right. Um, and while it can bring a lot of joy to care for someone, the journey does have specific challenges for both you and the person that you're caring for. So if there's nothing else that you take from today's webinar, please take this. You're not alone. Give yourself some credit for the many huge efforts that you're making as a caregiver and don't be afraid to ask for help. So um, as you can see, several areas we're gonna cover today. We're gonna talk about some Ontario stats on caregiving and the resulting resources and programming that have been put into place based on those stats. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about caregiving basics or what we call caregiver 101. 
Um, in our last four webinars, we talked about what grief is and the effects of grief for both adults and children, and also how grief is impacted by our current pandemic. And today, we're actually going to focus on what we call anticipatory grief, uh, which both the ill person and the caregivers and their families often feel. Um, we will discuss as well how to support each other. Um, we'll talk a little bit about caregiver burnout and the signs of burnout. Um, as well as how to take care of ourselves um, as caregivers during COVID-19. Um, we will talk about being present with the dying and what that means. We'll move on to legacy work. And given our current restrictions on visitors that we have in healthcare settings at this time, even though that's changing a little, there still are very strict restrictions. We'll look at what a virtual goodbye looks like. And if you're not a caregiver and you're on the webinar today, we'll end up with some tips on how to support those caregivers that you know in the community. So if we look at, um, in, in order to really better understand the caregiving experience, we, we need to look at the trends in Ontario of, of the role of the caregiver within the healthcare system, the type of tasks that they're doing, the time and maybe the financial commitment that's required to be a caregiver, and the impact on their mental, physical and emotional health. So um, some of the highlights from a survey that was done called Spotlight on Caregiving um, through the Ontario Caregivers Report, um, four main items um, were brought to light. The first being that caregivers really believe their family member would not receive the same level of care or attention if they weren't there to do it. Secondly, many caregivers don't think of themselves really as caregivers. Um, instead, they really look at themselves as a spouse or as a child, a parent doing their duty. Um, once caregivers realize that they're not alone uh, and that they do play a really important role in their family members' care, um, it's often very empowering for them. The third thing, many caregivers hesitate to admit that they're struggling and they often don't ask for help or support because Sometimes they feel guilty overshadowing the person that they're caring for. Um, and yet we know that the rates of stress and the feelings of being overwhelmed paint a really urgent picture of the need to really recognize and support family caregivers in their role. And lastly, the caregiving experience varies greatly um, and is influenced by many different factors. Uh, for example, where the caregiver lives, maybe who it is that they're caring for, maybe the other responsibilities they may have in their life um, and the length and intensity of their caregiving experience. I see caregivers who have been caregiving sometimes for very short periods of time, weeks or months, to very long intense periods of two to four years or longer. Some more stats. Um, 56% uh, of caregivers find the whole process difficult. 32% say they faced financial hardships. 79% see their role in the healthcare system as important. And the two top tasks performed by caregivers are emotional support and transportation, followed by household tasks and the scheduling of appointments. And another great need was the, the need for emotional counseling for both the patient and the caregiver. So more support needed in that area. Um, most caregivers though have a positive outlook and are coping well, while 31% are not coping well. So really this work just highlights that as a whole, caregivers really should be an urgent priority for us. Um, more stats from the Hospice Palliative Care Ontario. Um, more than 55,000 people in Ontario are caregiving. 41% report a negative effect on their mental health and 38% report a negative effect on their physical health. Um, family and formal caregivers are providing hospice palliative care at home and they're undertaking a wider range of, range of tasks and they typically receive less support from than professional caregivers. So um, there are a great number of resources available and provided to professional health care uh, teams to support individuals in their palliative care journey, but really for informal caregivers, um, they're often underestimated during this process 
and it can often feel as though they're not receiving the adequate support they need, the resources, and the services to help them be the best family caregiver that they can be. So one of the needs that was expressed um, in the Ontario Caregiver, Caregiver Report, um, Spotlight on Ontario Caregiving, was the need for a one-point access for information um, and resource right in the comfort of our homes. So the Ontario Caregiver Organization um, was launched and launched a 24-7 caregiver helpline by phone. And also during this current pandemic, they've been offering weekly online peer support groups to um, offset maybe any support groups that caregivers would have been attending in person in their own community. Um, they've also added more resources for caregivers during this pandemic, as well as caregiver stories and just education and newsletters. It's a wonderful site and I'll be referring to this, uh, this site several times throughout this webinar. Often I hear from caregivers that <clears throat> no matter how they came into this role, they feel completely overwhelmed. And not only with the diagnosis, but trying to navigate so many different areas. One of the quotes that um, a, caregiver, um, a caregiver said to me is, I feel like caregiving is like playing golf in the dark. And I hear things like this from caregivers all the time. They're really trying to navigate while at the same time not knowing where they are, what's behind them, what's in front of them, not knowing what to expect and even where to turn for help. So the Ontario Caregiver Organization surveyed more than a thousand caregivers to better understand their mental health impacts because of caregiving and the factors that contribute to their stress, their anxiety and their depression. And this resulted in a wish list for caregivers, which if these things are addressed, may improve their mental health. So to touch on some of them, as we can see from the diagram, um, caregivers who provide physical and emotional support to a family member or a friend or a neighbor wish for greater empathy and respect. Caregivers do not, they really don't wanna be a nuisance. They simply just wanna be a partner in the decision-making and the care planning of their loved one. And I often hear um, from caregivers all the time that they feel invisible. No one really sees them. No one acknowledges them in their role. But a lot of attention and care is directed to the person that they're caring for. Number two, they need help navigating the healthcare system. Caregivers often experience a great deal of frustration um, trying to navigate a very complicated healthcare system. And it takes a lot of time for this, which is time that caregivers don't always have as they're trying to balance that caregiving role with other roles that they may also have. Uh, maybe they have children, maybe they have a job at the same time. So they want, want some help navigating. The third thing, they want easier access to information and resources at the time that they need it. They often can sometimes receive too much information at the beginning of the caregiving journey and really find it hard to understand because they're already overwhelmed and stressed. At other times, they have difficulty finding the information when they need the information. So they want the right information at the right time. Or they want a greater understanding of the caregiver role. They often start their caregiving role feeling scared and unsure of how to do it, what to expect, um, then they need just as much support as the patient does too. Uh, five, they need more hands-on support. Um, they've said that they need time to take care of themselves, but many don't have or to take the breaks that they need. Often um, the respite that, that maybe they do receive is not really enough time to get things done and to kind of recharge their batteries again. Um, and they also wish that they had someone to talk to maybe to access counseling or a support group. And, and the last one, just a general awareness and peer support. So caregivers need support, not just from our healthcare system, but they also need support from their employers and their community too, as a whole. The Hospice Palliative Care Ontario organization um, is not only the governing body for all of Ontario hospices, but also provides very valuable resources
resources for both professionals and the general public on palliative care and caregiving. Um, and based on the stats that we've talked about, um, they have designed and added to their, um, their website uh, what we call the caregiver modules. Uh, so there's 20, I believe, caregiver modules that really um, further strengthen that capacity for caregivers who help their loved ones to remain at home at the end of life. And the modules cover many areas, and they are that, they are that really, um, you know, you can look up something when you're dealing with it, whether it's the pain that your loved one is having, pain and symptom management, whether it's um, conflicts with family members, what do I do when this happens? Um, there's information there on signs of approaching death. Um, and really these modules are ready and available exactly at the time that caregivers need it in the comfort of their home. These modules also include what uh, we call the six stages of caregiving, uh, which are quite common to experience. We're not going to go into all of those stages today, given our time, but um, please know that you can access that on the HPCO website in the caregiving modules. And really just within those stages of caregiving, knowing what you're experiencing is normal. Um, and uh, a normal part of your journey may really provide some comfort and understanding um, and may help you to kind of anticipate what's to come and to plan for what's to come next and prepare for it. So caregiving 101, caregiving basics. Um, what do caregivers need to know when they're faced with the knowledge that they are now in that caregiving role, whether they came to this role of their own wishes or maybe they were kind of thrown into this role. What are the things they need to know? Three main things here. Building a good support team around you. This means you know, asking family members or friends for help, looking around for professional services that can help you now or even in the future. Um, Second thing, really look at what your needs are as a caregiver. And the Ontario Caregiving Organization has a really um, neat quiz, a survey kind of thing online that you can take that really kind of assesses your, where you're at with your physical and your mental health. What it is that you need? Is it respite that you need? Is it transportation? Is it someone to talk to? Um, or if you're a young caregiver, where is it that you turn? Um, so reflecting on your needs and then attending to your needs. We talk a lot about self-care at hospice and self-care as a caregiver is very important. Add self-care to your routine. Try to fit it in somewhere. This caregiver burnout is a very real thing. Um, and so it's really important to find what, what works for you. Is it going for a walk? Is it yoga? Is it meditation? Is it prayer? Is it talking to a friend or is it seeking out professional help? So I'll hand this over to Kayla at this time. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so we wanna take a little bit of time just to talk about grief um, because it's quite evident that for many caregivers, uh, they may be experiencing uh, grief potentially long before um, even the death of a loved one. And so we're gonna start with just some definitions. So grief, when we're talking about grief, this is a constellation of internal thoughts and feelings that we might have uh, when we lose someone or something. So grief doesn't just occur when someone dies, it can occur when we experience any type of loss. So that may be uh, the loss of a relationship, a divorce, the loss of a job, uh, perhaps retirement, empty nesters can grieve, uh, having their kids at home. So there's many different types of um, losses that we can grieve and there's many different types of grief as well. And so you may hear terms like complicated grief or acute grief or integrated grief, but the main type of grief that we're gonna talk about and focus on today is anticipatory grief. And so anticipatory grief is um, grief experienced uh, prior to the death, um, which means so we're anticipating uh, the pain and changes that um, that loss will bring or has already brought. So we're going to focus on this a bit more in a second. Um, and so mourning is the act of outwardly experiencing and expressing uh, one's grief. So uh, we kind of think of um, 
grief as you know all the things inside so like get the ins like a bot inside of a bottle that we're bottling up inside of our heads our our brains our I mean our hearts and what we're feeling internally um, and then mourning is how we're expressing that openly so it may be through you know talking about our grief um, expressing you know our grief or our sadness through tears and crying uh, for some it may be you know wearing black or for some may be in engaging in rituals uh, praying another form of mourning and, and often our, our expressions of mourning um, can be associated with our either family cultural or uh, spiritual traditions we tend to kind of follow you know, traditions that we were we learned in our upbringing or that uh, you know bring us meaning and value and, and comfort and support so it is a, very important to uh, just be aware of sometimes what that what grief we're experiencing and then ways uh, healthy ways to express it outwardly and then lastly, bereavement. So bereavement uh, refers to the period of, of mourning and grief following the death of a, of a loved one. And so bereavement is death specific, whereas when we're talking about grief, it doesn't necessarily mean death, it just means loss uh, more in general. So uh, go to the next slide, Lisa. So um, if you are a caregiver listening, uh, you may be reading some of these uh, statements here and uh, you may be able to relate to maybe one of them or all of them. Maybe you've asked yourself this before. Um, and so all these statements are referring to forms of anticipatory grief. And so often caregivers um, can be grieving the death that hasn't happened yet. And so this may include you know, what life used to be like prior to a loved one becoming ill you know, things might be different for you now, or you may be having thoughts of, of the loss of the future that you had hoped for and what you're preparing for or, or not sure what to prepare for anymore. Maybe you had those hopes and dreams and, and that you're not really sure, right? Or that's changing. So you may be, um, you know, you may be feeling grief now, you may be wondering um, and, and thinking about what you hoped for. And so if any of these, um, you know, you can relate to it, it likely is anticipatory grief that you are experiencing. So Lisa, if you want to go to the next slide for me. So we're going to debunk this myth a little bit more so that grief, you know, begins after a loved one dies uh, because it can certainly happen before. And so um, anticipatory grief may feel like or, or look like uh, very similar to, um, you know, grief after the death of a loved one. So you may be experiencing, um, you know, lots of similar emotions. There may be anger, sadness, um, isolation, forgetfulness, you know, physical pain. Um, many of those same emotions and, and experiences can be the same uh, when you're experiencing anticipatory grief. And anticipatory grief can be experienced by, um, you know, the person that is ill, um, their, their caregivers, um, as well as other friends or, or loved ones um, who play a big part in their life or have a significant relationship with the ill person. Um, and so you may be experiencing, you um, loss of the person that you knew and their abilities, or if or for an ill person, loss of some your own abilities, right? So maybe it's loss of ability, you know, to walk, maybe to read, uh, engage in hobbies or activities that you once enjoyed or that your loved one once enjoyed and, and being able to, and watching them lose those abilities themselves, maybe, um, you know, eating or enjoying food still, um, or it could be things like memory. And so, um, all these like examples of significant losses um, may be to one person, but it may not be to the next, right? And so if um, an ill person may be experiencing many different losses than, and, than you as the caregiver. So it's just uh, to be mindful that, um, you know, you and your loved ones may be experiencing grief for, for various reasons, right? And very different reasons sometimes. Um, you may be also, you know, grieving the loss of the role and the role that you had in their life or the role that um, your relationship played. So, you know, being a spouse, um, being a brother or a sister or a mother, um, maybe it's, you know, you're the grocery shopper, you're the social one who makes plans. Those are all different roles in our lives that may also be changing or, or feel like they're um, maybe not as prevalent or, or maybe you're anticipating that, that type of loss. Um, in the future that may be yeah changed or, or gone um, and so a loss of the future with that person as well so this is um, a big one so we all have hopes for the future we all have you know dreams uh, for how perhaps how you thought that you may have spent your say, your retirement years or uh, years in your adulthood may have now dramatically changed since um, your spouse or a loved, a loved one has become ill um, and you 
or, or maybe you're, you know, thinking ahead of, of, you know, major milestones or events in life that you're wondering, um, you know, that your person might not be there, right? Maybe it's walking your daughter down the, the wedding aisle or, or missing the birth of a grandchild. Those are all, you know, aspects of life and, and the future that you, you know, one day may be expected to have with your person. And so another thing to consider um, when we're also thinking about advanced care, when we're thinking about advanced care planning is when you're looking ahead um, at what you want your dying to be like or your loved ones, um, that's also processing some of these emotions, um, you know, early as well. So, and then, yeah, so we wanted to touch a little bit more again on what grief can look like. So I mentioned this, how we can experience grief um, in our whole body. So it can expect our, our whole being, um, meaning physically, emotionally, uh, psychologically, mentally, spiritually, socially. And so anticipatory grief can also affect us in all these uh, different components of our lives. Um, and I, I kind of mentioned a few examples here. So um, yeah, so just noticing, noticing that if you are experiencing some of these um, changes and experiences, maybe it's, you know, confusion, uh, loss of memory, trouble, um, you know, or like what we call grief fog. So it's all kind of blurring together. You're having a hard time thinking straight. Uh, those are kind of psychological examples. Um, you may have lots of spiritual or religious questions um, around why, why is this happening to me or my family? Uh, questioning, you know, your higher power and, and your belief system or what your views are in life. Um, and and when we're, we're talking about socially, this may be again, loss of like social identity, maybe the social network or relationships that you had, you may be feeling extra isolated. So these are just all some examples and there's so, so many and, and grief is so unique to every individual. So what you may be experiencing, again, may be very different than say a friend that has also been a caregiver and, and they're grieving or very different than what you've experienced um, you know, amongst other losses that you've had in your life. Okay, so we'll take a little look at um, common caregiver emotions and focus on emotions just for a little bit. As a caregiver, um, you will experience or may experience a wide range of emotions and sometimes you can have several emotions at the same time. For example, you may feel really grateful for the time that you have with your loved one, while at the same time feeling resentful that this is how your life is now like. You may be emotionally exhausted from providing that care 24 seven with little sleep and maybe other commitments like just having children or work as well. You may feel angry. Anger, I think, and frustration are really both really common to have for a lot of people. And the anger may come from being maybe forced into this role. This wasn't what you thought you would be doing. It might be anger and frustration about putting your future plans on hold from, it could be lack of support that you know, you thought certain family members would step up and help out or friends and there may be anger around um, not receiving that. Um, or you may just feel really just angry about the healthcare system just in general. Guilt is another really common emotion for people. Guilt for not maybe, I hear quite often from caregivers, I, they feel guilty for not being able to do more or for thinking that they could have done this in this situation or they could have done something better in that situation. Feeling lonely and isolated also is common, if, especially if there's no one else to help out and you are the only one caregiving or lo lonely just in terms of other people not understanding what you're going through. Um, fear and anxiety of, you know, what's gonna happen next, what's to come or just anxiety about being in this state of limbo, not knowing you know, what is the future gonna, like, gonna look like for me. And during COVID-19, you know, this feeling of isolation and being alone in your role probably is maybe stronger for you. You may have less visitors that come and help out and provide respite at this time. You may not be able to get out yourself as a caregiver for, for the self-care that you used to, to do for yourself. You know, if it was going to the gym or if it was going to a yoga class, those things aren't happening right now. You may fear yourself as a caregiver of um, leaving the house to run errands in case you yourself become sick and maybe pass on the virus to your loved one. You know, a recent um, caregiver said to me that, you know, her husband who was ill was willing to take that risk of 
seeing friends up close and having family and friends come into the house um, to see him um, and take that risk to say goodbye um, and, and be with his loved ones, but that her worry as his wife and her caregiver is caregiver is that you know if he becomes sick with the virus, that she may not be able to visit him in the hospital. What's that gonna look like if he gets sick and has the virus? Is she gonna be able to be with him at end of life? Some other com uh, common caregiver emotions that sometimes we don't talk about that are really positive are, you know, as a caregiver, you may feel very proud of yourself for what you've been able to accomplish and for doing the best that you can in, in given your situation. Um, you may have more strength, a greater inner strength. Uh, you may feel closer to the person that you're caring for or a deeper love for the person that you're caring for. Um, and another thing that I hear a lot is just the gratefulness for the love and support of family and friends and the, the unique ways that they provide their support. And during COVID-19, um, you may even have, you feel more blessed for the different strategic ways that other people are showing their love and support at this time, whether it's, you know, through more phone calls or whether it's dropping off food, the del deliveries of food, deliveries of, you know, gifts of kindness, emails, or even, you know, through virtual visiting. And I kind of just want to highlight that, you know, the last two slides on the caregiver emotions that are common are also common emotions for the ill person as well. So good to keep that in mind as well. So these are, I just want to kind of talk about, you know, what, what does it feel like? What is the person who's receiving the care? What are the, some of the things that they're feeling as the ill person? Um, and so, you know, that sense of losing control over their life because of their condition. And so, you know, that loss of control can be really scary. And there may be times where they resist and don't want your help um, to care for them. And that can sometimes be misconstrued, but this is a really common reaction to the loss of independence. No one wants to lose their independence. Sadness from, you know, maybe a changed self-image, what they used to look like before. Um, the fear of becoming too dependent and a burden on the family. This is a very, very big concern for the dying. No one wants to be a burden to their family. Um, they may have fear that old friends um, distance themselves. And of course, during COVID right now, there is definitely distancing, distancing, physical distancing from friends and family. Um, but in general, for the dying, there is that fear that, that people will step away now that I'm sick. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes that does happen uh, with friends and family. And, you know, people mean well, and sometimes they're scared themselves, and sometimes they're grieving themselves. And so um, they may distance themselves to protect themselves. Anger and frustration, again, um, very common towards their condition itself, which um, again can be misdirected to the caregiver. Um, there could be denial of the condition um, and, its, and, effect, and its effects. And, you know, the dying person can go from denial to acceptance, back to denial again, and back and forth. Very normal. They may fear becoming isolated from the world since they are no longer able to get around as easily as they once did. I know, you know some of the Ill, pe Ill people that I work with have said that losing their license was the, um, you know, the, one of the worst losses because they really lost their independence and ability to get around without someone else's help. So I really talk a little bit about supporting our, each other through this. And often, as I said, the caregiver and the ill person are experiencing um, some of the same things. And, and Kayla talked a little bit about that anticipatory grief that both might be feeling. Um, and often they share the similar losses, maybe in a different way, but both are losing their independence. Both maybe have a loss of their social life and, and their, their connection with their, their social, their friends, um, loss of freedom, loss of privacy as several workers maybe are coming now into the home, personal support workers and nursing, and you kind of lose that, that, uh, 
privacy that you maybe you once had. Um, but there, you know, you may be able to support one another and take comfort in really special moments together. So this is just um, I I um, picked this from the Ontario Caregivers Guide um, on ways to support each other and things like. Um, taking cues from your loved one and how they're feeling um, and acknowledging their feelings and, and your feelings and being truthful with one another, respecting each other's privacy, um, sharing your hopes and your thoughts and your feelings. It may provide comfort for both you and the person you're caring for. Um, enjoy the good days and make the best of the, the time that you do have together take advantage of the days that are going well. Some caregivers will tell me that they have what they call non-cancer days, where they just live in the moment. They decide to spend that day not talking about cancer or the disease or anything like that, um, and just living in the moment of that day without that anxiety. Reminisce about your life together, you know, the good times and the bad times. It's really important to also include your loved one in family activities. Um, often the dying person can feel excluded and feel like they're not able really to participate as they used to in family occasions. And um, for example, if they were always the one that cooked the Thanksgiving meal or the Christmas meal, and now they don't enough, have enough energy and strength to do that, it's important to try and include them in some other way. And maybe that's you know, coming up with the menu for that day. Or maybe it's being able to sit at the table and still cut up the vegetables and do some of that work that they love to do. Um, another really important one for each other is take care of yourselves. Um, and accept help from others um, because there usually are others out there that wanna lend a helping hand and help you out as much as they can. So when we look at anticipatory grief and what it looks like during, uh, during COVID-19 as a caregiver, um, these are some of the things that um, maybe are happening for you. You may feel more even more isolated in your role as a caregiver. Perhaps maybe you had family and friends and um, neighbors who came to the home to help out with things like respite and now they just can't or they don't feel safe doing that. You may feel less social or physical connection to your families and friends, to your family and friends um, who would normally, you know, do social activities with you, visit with you. Another real one for people is that fear and anxiety about who's going to take care of my loved one if I get COVID. Um, so you may have those questions and we'll go on to talk about that a little bit further here. You may feel disconnected from your medical team by maybe having phone appointments only. You know, I've spoken to caregivers who, you know, their, their husband, um, you know, goes to, to their hospital appointments, but um, the spouse cannot come in and cannot come with them. And so quite often they're on, on speakerphone. Um, so again, that's not the same as being with your loved one. You may be missing out on, like, like I've said before, your normal forms of self-care. You know, if that was going out to the gym, or going for coffee with a friend, or getting massage or yoga class. Maybe those things aren't happening for you now. Um, you may have more anxiety about the what ifs, like what if my, what does it, what's it gonna look like if my loved one has to go into hospital or has to go into hospice? Will I be able to visit regularly? What will these visits look like? You may be faced with decisions about your, your um, medical care, your home care. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I know I had some of my ill clients that had decided that it just really wasn't worth the risk to have their personal support workers coming in as regularly as they were. Uh, where others kept their personal support workers, but they did have that worry and anxiety uh, about the possible spread of COVID. And then finally, you may be anticipating the, the limited funeral services. And I know that it has changed somewhat. I think we've went from 10 people to I think 50 now that can go to a funeral. Um, but it doesn't look the same. And some people have postponed the funerals for a later date um, and just generally smaller in size. So another area of anxiety for caregivers and the ill. So Ontario Caregiver Organization 
um, developed a list of kind of what we call precautionary measures that caregivers can take to keep themselves and the person they care for safe during this pandemic. And um, really, it's really important to have a contingency plan in general um, in case you as the caregiver become sick. Um, uh, but especially now during COVID-19, um, this is especially important. So who's going to step in for me? Think about who is it in your family or friends that could possibly step in for you should you become sick yourself. You know, keep a lot of caregivers do this already, but keeping notes of your routine and your doctor's numbers and your clinic and pharmacy numbers, um, as well as the name and doses of medication um, that your loved one is having, having that laid out on paper for yourself, um, having extra supplies on hand. And really just what technology am I familiar with to use if I can't be in the same place as my loved one um, or fam for family and friends to connect with me. And I just wanna add here that another step that can be taken for caregivers to, um, is to really gain some knowledge about you know, what are the visiting rights right now at hospital uh, in the palliative care? What are the visiting rights in hospice right now? Um, and they can be changing. And so you might wanna call ahead and just look into that because it might form your decision of where your loved one will wish to be at the end of life. So in order to take care of ourselves um, as caregivers during COVID-19, um, these are just some points to keep in mind. Um, there's a lot of information being shared out there and um, sometimes we spend a lot of time watching and reading and listening to the news about COVID and that can create a lot of anxiety and stress for us. And so really it's reducing your exposure to those things and maybe only updating yourself with trusted resources like for example, the Ontario government website um, every now and then, but not spending a lot of time on, of your day doing that can lessen anxiety. Keep a regular routine as much as possible um, and create new ones if that helps you out. Um, keep regular contact with the person that you care for, even if you can't visit them in person. Prepare a plan should you become ill, which we've talked about, and a contingency plan. Um, stay connected through phone and technology. Um, for some people, um, they're, not, they're not comfortable with the computer and so they, they keep in contact through phone. Um, if someone you love, um, someone you're caring for is in a long-term care home, you know, check to see what technology that they have, that they're using. Um, and I know that that's changing too and that um, I think, believe there are some visits happening in long-term care homes just with one, uh, one um, identified person that can go in. Share positive stories of people that have recovered from COVID-19 because there are a lot of those. And um, maybe it's thanking your healthcare providers and um, thanking your personal support worker, thanking your nurses for their commitment at this time. Um, another really important one, you know, not just during COVID for caregivers, but just is really attending to your needs and your feelings. Um, and that it's okay and normal to feel really down and sad sometimes. And, um, sometimes more than others and that it's okay to cry and sometimes crying is a way of letting it out. And then finally connecting with professional support um, in the community and other caregivers as well. So um, I've added this slide, um, the Ontario, um, the Speak Up Ontario um, website um, is, uh, offers lots of valuable information and resources to those that are trying to do some advanced care planning uh, with their family members. And this is just one of the resources that they have, which is um, a workbook that can be filled out with your loved ones. Um, just, just beginning that conversation of talking about what their wishes are and what their values are and what they would wanna see happen if they couldn't speak for themselves at end of life. Um, and so this particular workshop can be uh, workbook can be accessed online, it can be downloaded, but as well, um, if you go on to the Speak Up Ontario website, um, you can order a maximum of two copies of this workbook and it can be shipped to at you at your address with no, uh, no cost at all. And so just really, you know, I think COVID-19 is really highlighting that, you know, at any point in our health, um, it can change and without warning and you never know when you're going to need someone to speak on your behalf if you're not able to. So I added this slide because of that, but advanced care planning is very important for anyone 
at any time. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit here and talk a little bit about caregiver burnout. Um, and I'm um, looking at my time here and I've got about quarter to two and I've got quite a bit left to cover. So I'm going to kind of switch over to this one and talk about the symptoms of caregiver burnout because caregiver burnout is very real um, and can be very scary. And as a caregiver, you may find yourself having some of these symptoms off and on throughout that journey that you're on. However, if you're having a lot of these symptoms on an ongoing basis, it may be time to kind of um, make an appointment with your family doctor or perhaps even look into some support like counseling or group support. And um, I want to kind of highlight here that at hospice, we do offer one-on-one uh, -on -one virtual counseling for caregivers at this time, as well as virtual support groups um, twice monthly and um, regular phone support as well. Um, so some of the signs of um, burnout would be, you know, the urge to run and hide from responsibility, um, your activities scattered, there's a change in your sleeping patterns or your eating habits, maybe you're often irritable or easily to anger, not able to concentrate and forgetting important details, maybe you've increased your use of alcohol, drugs or tobacco, um, and loss of more than 10 pounds or sleeping less than three hours a night. So this was from the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association. So I just encourage that if you're feeling a lot of these all the time, it may be time to reach out and get some help. So I'm gonna kind of switch gears a little bit again here. Excuse me. Um, this uh, is one of the um, things that we they talk about in the HPCO caregiver modules that you can find online. And um, what we know is that as people move along the trajectory of their life limiting illness, they're likely to experience a wide range of emotions and um, they may need help in coping with that anxiety and fear and maybe the search for meaning. Um, and we know that um, people's emotional needs are, are, are greater usually during transition times of a disease. So it might be, you know, for example, when the disease is first diagnosed, when, you know, after remission, it recurs again. It might be when the disease is progressing or when the person can no longer do the things that they once did. And then finally, when they're nearing end of life and are becoming weaker and more frail. And so we talk at hospice about being present and really you can provide the greatest support as a caregiver and family member by being present. And being present involves a lot of different things. And as you can see on this diagram, it's you know being with the person physically and emotionally, um, just being with them. Sometimes it doesn't require any language or any communication. It's just sitting and being with them and being that presence for them. Sometimes it is listening, being a good listener and listening to their feelings and concerns. It's important that you sit down at their eye level, that you're not standing over their bed or standing over them, that you're at their level. It's really grounding um, to hear your name. And so saying their name often um, is very comforting. Really, I know, just be yourself. I often at times hear people say, I don't know what to say, I'm not sure what to do, um, but be yourself, just be your ordinary self match their mood and behavior so you know if they're having a moment of sadness you know be with them in that moment don't try to change the subject make eye contact um, be respectful uh, pay attention to their body language as well as their words sometimes there may not be as many words from that person and so it might be paying attention to the body language their face to see kind of how they're feeling and how they're doing if you're not sure what to say, you know, you can even start opening a conversation by, tell me about this, tell me about the time that this happened. Um, being attentive and always not to forget to, to laugh. It's still okay to laugh. In fact, it's very therapeutic to laugh and have a sense of humor. So, um, this is a picture of Dame Cicely Saunders, who was an English nurse and social worker and a physician, as well as a writer. 
and she's really noted for her work in palliative care research um, and her role in the hospice movement. And one of the things that she did was she described the three needs of the dying as being stay with me, care for me, listen to me. So as we talked about in the previous slide about being present, that really is being present, staying with someone, caring for them, and just listening to them, being with them. Switching gears a little bit again and talking about spirituality. And um, spirituality really has to do with peace and purpose. And um, it's the process of developing beliefs around the meaning and the purpose in our life and in our connection with others. Um, and quite often when we, we talk about spirituality, we may think of religion. And definitely religion is a component of spirituality, but you don't have to be religious to be spiritual. And some people find they look to spirituality through maybe their connection with nature or maybe their connection with music. Spirituality evaluates what gives meaning to our life, what gives purpose to our life. It's really exploring our core beliefs. Is it family? Is it love? Is it faith? Is it our values and our goals? When confronting a life-limiting illness, um, this can bring on spiritual growth in people. It may have you questioning your belief system or maybe reaffirming it. It can be the most important way of coping for many, uh, many ill and, and family members. So as the quote says, spirituality is the aspect of humanity that refers to the way individuals seek and express meaning and purpose and the way they express their connectedness to the moment, to self, to others, to nature and or to the significant and the sacred. Dr. Kenneth Doka is a leading expert on grief counseling and therapy and a noted author of several books on death, dying and bereavement. And he speaks of the spiritual needs of the dying. To, meet, to live a meaningful life, to die an appropriate death and to continue beyond the grave. And when he speaks of appropriate death, Really, appropriate death is based on the dying person's definition of what that is, not what our defini of, of definition of that is. And when he says to continue beyond the grave, this is where he's talking about the legacies that we leave behind for our family members. We want to know that we, we have meaning and it will go on beyond our life. When learning about a serious illness, um, we, you know, maybe I just want to kind of point out this picture of the flower um, uh, representing hope. Um, and, you know, hope can change over time and there's always hope. But when you learn of a serious illness, your hope can be maybe for a cure at the beginning. Maybe your hope is that the treatments are going to work. And then maybe when no cure is possible, the hope may shift to living the rest of your life as well as possible. It might be to be loved and to love. It might be to live in the present moment with satisfaction. As illness progresses, hope may focus on the circumstances of the death, to have maybe your symptoms controlled, to be pain-free, uh, or who will be present at the time of my death. Sometimes individuals think that hope is lost at the end of life, but really hope changes as their situation changes. And sometimes people just need to kind of reconfigure, reformulate those broken hopes and believing that no matter how bad the situation, hope can always be found. At the end of life, hope may center around living to participate in a special event, going to a wedding, seeing the birth of a grandchild, have the, maybe having the opportunity to say goodbye, to having a peaceful, pain-free death. And some people are hopeful in living well despite their advanced disease rather than the expectation of a cure. Um, and for some people, they may hold, hold on to hope for a miracle and a cure and a recovery until the very end, and that's okay too. Um, you know, we find that with grief, death, and dying, there are many different paradoxes that we need to learn to accept. And, for many, there is space for both hope for a cure while also planning your death at the same time. 
So if we look at, um, you know, leaving a legacy, what we leave behind, or that our lives have meaning, legacy work isn't just about death and dying, it's about life and living. It's about making connections and sharing really special moments with the people in our lives. Um, and one of the most important things to know about legacy work is that there are no rules, there's no restrictions, um, there's no limitations. You don't have to have a lot of money or time and you don't have to have a life limiting illness either. Legacy work can be done at any time and can take any form. You know, at hospice, we've done many things. Um, for example, our music therapist has written songs with individuals who are dying um, as a sort of a song to go on, to outlive them, a song that they participated in um, as a legacy. Uh, you know, for example, on here, you can create a scrapbook together, create a collection of favorite recipes, create a video, handprints there that are in um, plaster is also an idea. It could even be creating a book for your grandchild um, or a book for your children. I know we're coming close up on time here. I think I have maybe three minutes, four minutes left. So I'm gonna try and tie this up as quickly as I can. Um, Dr. Ira Bayok is a, a palliative care physician and he has a wonderful book called Dying Well and included, included in this book is a guide for how to say goodbye. And this can also work for virtual goodbye. So for those times where you're not able to physically be with someone when they're dying, you can still touch on these things with your loved one, um, maybe virtually. And so these are kind of the five essential things that um, to say to a dying person that are not meant to be in any, any specific priority and different people will put different value on, on the different statements, but you can do some, skip some, whatever works for you. So a dying person and their family may need to say, please forgive me, you know, um, you may be bothered by regrets about something hurtful that you did or that you said. And, and so saying, you, you can start by saying, you know, I've been thinking about something that I said and I just want to apologize for it. I forgive you. If you ask for forgiveness, they may also. Thank you. You know, saying thank you for the positive ways that your loved one has touched your life is a way of le letting them know how much they mean to you and that, um, you know, contributes to their sense of dignity at the end of life. I love you. It's never too late to say I love you and goodbye. When your loved one is nearing death, it's really important to end each conversation in a way that is it's going to be okay if it's the last time you speak to each other. So um, that goodbye could be as mushy as you want or not mushy, whatever works for you. Um, but just saying goodbye in a way that lets the person know that they'll always be important to you. So I'm going to skip over this slide right here, given time, but essentially, um, you know, these, these ways of saying goodbye can be done virtually. And really just want to highlight from this slide that, um, you know, if it, if it is a situation where you are communicating with your loved one through uh, virtual means, um, that, um, you know, a lot of the healthcare staff are assisting with that. And so, you know, they may be the one holding the phone or the computer. Um, as you speak to your loved one. And so um, really just kind of highlighting that um, you know, it's, it's not ideal, um, but um, it's very real in these times uh, of COVID-19. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's all I'll say to that, just given time. <laughs> um, and um, how to support caregivers in your community, just some um, points there. And I think I just want to kind of end with, um, uh, leaving with a quote from a book called Caregiver Defined by Michael Fortuna, and he defines the word community. When you're feeling alone and isolated in your caregiving, remember that you're a part of a large, wondrous community, an army of people doing the same good works as you, many of them feeling equally lonely in their efforts. So take solace in knowing that when you're rendering your care, countless others are doing the same. When you're tired in body and soul, remember the equal exhaustion of your counterparts and use it as an incentive to find your second wind. The community of caregivers is always there in spirit to support you, to nudge you, to try harder, to help you do the job you promised. Their strength becomes yours, and in a very beautiful way, yours then becomes theirs. 
So just um, ending up with some caregiver resources here um, that, um, again, we will send out these resources um, to those that are on the webinar, or you may even email us and we can send them along to you, but very helpful. And I used a lot of these in my presentation today. Want to take that over, Kayla? Thank you, Lisa. That was wonderful. Um, so we just wanted to quickly just highlight some of our services that we are currently offering. If you do have to leave, please uh, feel free to go ahead. If you do have any questions, you can add them in the chat box. Um, or our contact information is on the bottom of this page right here. And so you can either call, um, you know, myself, Lisa, or our email is there as well for our supportive services. Um, and so right now, uh, as part of Lisa's program, we are offering, or, or Lisa is offering, uh, the, the caregiver drop-in um, twice a month. Um, and it, it does require registration and assessment and that sort of thing. So you can check with Lisa if you're interested in that. Um, and we also have just started um, either virtual or telephone one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling with our spiritual care coordinator. Um, and that is for either an ill client or um, for any caregivers. So again, you can always contact Lisa or our supportive services email if you are interested in that. Um, Lisa, if you want to go ahead to the next couple slides, we'll just skip forward yeah. and to our um, preferences. I'm not seeing any questions so far in our chat box. Okay. So um, yes, thank you everyone for being here and for attending. Um, we hope that you found this uh, helpful and um, all the information uh, and you will be receiving the handouts um, next week. Um, so if we, if you didn't catch all this uh, here today or if you want to reference back, you will have a copy of this. So thank you everyone. Again, thank you everyone and have a good day.